In my previous installment of the series, I had Andy Lee's fight with Jackson. This was literally Lee's next fight. So there was some alleged drama coming into this fight. Rapper Jay-Z attempted to dip into the boxing industry with his sports promotional banner, Rock Nation Sports, and started off with minor success signing up fighters. Korobov, who was a highly regarded contender, was one of them. He was a mandatory opponent of Peter Quillen's WBO title. As ambitious as the new promotion was, an insane amount of money was thrown out during the purse bid. Rock Nation won the purse bid by a landslide of $1.9 million to $1.2 million. Quillen was set to make an all-time high of his entire career. So this is where the alleged drama took place. This is a rumor, tall tale, not fact. Al Heyman supposedly had beef with Beyonce at that time. Jay-Z by association. Heyman pieced together a great plan, the fight was off, Quillen vacated the title, Andy Lee was promoted, and now it's a fight for the WBO middleweight title between Korobov and Lee. With all that being said, let's get started with Andy Lee. Emmanuel Stewart saw Lee's talent early and said one day he will become the world champion. This was Lee's last crack at the title and he made it known that he will fulfill Emmanuel Stewart's prophecy and win this fight to become world champion. Everything's come together at the right time and now it's time for me to fulfill that dream and make sure the words Emmanuel said when he said I'd be world champion. The fight started off rather even. Lee did have his moments, but Korobov seemed to be ahead. In the sixth round, Korobov catches Lee with a perfect shot, and briefly, it looked like he got Lee good. Till before you know it, Lee had landed his signature right. The same right that bailed him out of his last fight. This is just destiny here. Korobov is out on his feet, almost completely defenseless. Bayless trying to give him a chance, and was later forced to step in and stop the fight. Lee is finally a world champion. This title's for him, but it's also for the man who made me, Emmanuel Stewart. We spent, I lived with him for, for nearly seven, eight years. He, he said I would win a world title. His wife Marie came here today to watch me fight, flew all the way from Detroit. And I love all the Rich Stewart family, Sugar Hill and Diane, and everybody in De Detroit. And Kronk, thank you very much. So Dylan White became the mandatory opponent for the WBC title long, long ago. He won the WBC interim title, pretty much further signaling he is the mandatory. Now coming into 2020, he really could have just sat on rank and not fought or fought a guy within the top 100. But he decided to risk all that waiting on a side quest against a hungry Alexander Povetkin, which this is more than likely his last run at the title. Ironically enough, I made a meme of White's situation using one of Loiter Squad's skits. And little I would know, this would actually come to life. And don't ever come back! Oh, oh shit! The fight started off a bit of a feeling out, but White having the clear edge over the H warrior Povetkin. In the fourth round, White would drop Povetkin not once, but twice. Luckily, the second knockdown was at the end of the round, and Povetkin was saved by the bell. Povetkin, in the fifth, showing signs of wear, knows that if he doesn't do something this round and get this man out, his run at the title is over. And in the first 30 seconds of the fifth, the first effective shot Povetkin threw the whole fight would completely end white. But that is one of the oh, most no. shocking turnarounds I've ever oh, seen in a fight, Unbelievable! What a left uppercut! This was the ninth title defense by Terry Norris. Waters was ranked number five by the WBC. He was a heavy underdog, virtually unknown, as this was his first fight in America. This fight started off as your usual prime Terry Norris fight, dropping Waters in the first and just working him the whole round. Round two was looking just like that. Norris was landing beautifully, and at that pace, it looked like this or the next round, he was going to finish him off, till Waters landed a crystal clear combo in Norris. Norris. From the looks of it, that body shot combination really bothered Norris to where he let his guard down and Waters was able to follow through and drop him. Norris now pretty angry, I mean just look at him. Instead of going on the defensive
defensive, he is immediately on waters, turning this fight into a brawl. Both guys having their moments and shining, Norris was able to get the best out of those exchanges to end the round off. This round being named 1993 Ring Magazine Round of the Year, Norris continued to bulldoze through till he finally cracked waters in the second half of the third round. Surprisingly, the fight was not stopped and Waters barely made it out the round. The corner stopped the fight before the fourth round started. Norris is still angry to where the ref and the trainer had to calm him down. If anyone can tell me the backstory on this, please comment. The first fight was amazing, the rematch was equally amazing. Back and forth action, Quadras dropped Estrada early in the third. Estrada was able to tie the knockdown count, dropping Quadras in the 11th round. Quadras putting up a valiant effort, couldn't get Estrada off him. After the second knockdown and more punishment, he was later stopped in the final minute of the 11th. I like to put out there, Estrada fights this weekend in a unification match against Roman Gonzalez. This fight is a guaranteed war. Both guys have slowed down just a bit where I am almost certain both are going to be trading knockdowns. This rematch has been almost nine years in the making and I can't wait for this Saturday. So originally there were talks of number two ranked WBC champion Takashi Mura unifying against number one ranked WBA champion Takashi Uchiyama in a highly anticipated rematch for the ring title. That fight did not fall through and the WBC ordered that Mura face mandatory challenger undefeated Francisco Vargas. Now your boy was working that fight week and the fight. My first boxing event I stepped foot in. Young intern honcho. Yep, that's me right there. I have no designated seat so when working I have to move all over the arena to get my shots which made my job quite difficult as I was given the wrong credential at that time. So I literally had to ninja my way all over the place. Place. Anyways, Vargas caught Mira cold, almost dropping him in the first. <laughs> Mira would bounce back slowly, pecking and pecking away, but not winning the rounds as Vargas was up on Harold's card 3 to zip. Mira would drop Vargas in the second half of the fourth round. Vargas would put up a great effort going toe to toe with Mira, but Mira was winning the exchanges and looking like the fresher fighter. Mira would hurt Vargas towards the end of the 8th round, trying to finish him off but was saved by the bell. Coming into the ninth round, no one saw this coming. Vargas started the round off with an anomaly of sharp shots to drop Mira. That venue was so quiet during the fight and it wasn't at max capacity. The whole venue was literally shaking from the crowd while and out. I was like, where did all these people come from? Mira is out on his feet. Vargas is going for broke. Not the wisest of decisions, but Mira attempted to go on the offensive rather than try to hold Vargas, resulting in Vargas to just pummel him more to where Tony Weeks was forced to stop the fight. This was Garcia's biggest test, make or break fight, and holy crap, this was not starting well. Ryan was having his moments offensively, not really landing effectively, but you can see Luke was setting up trap cards on him. And within due time, Luke flattened Garcia. Most folks would have not gotten up from that, but he did and he was able to pull through and regroup for the next round. Ryan immediately knew what he did wrong and agreed with Eddie since they were working on this in training camp to fix these bad habits and he was easily able to make those adjustments which I would like to compare to a fight that was literally just days before with Kosei Tanaka and Kazuto Oyoka. Tanaka came into the fight with bad habits, never ended up fixing in camp, and Ioka completely exploited that to where each knockdown was caused by those bad habits. So Garcia was easily able to correct his defensive flaw to where Luke could not recreate the same thing he did before. To where Garcia was able to have success, hurt him in the fifth bad, then to finish him off with a picture perfect body shot in the seventh round.
This looked like it was going to be an early night for Evander. He drops Cooper with a beautiful combination to the body in the first round and just outworks him for the rest of the round. In the third, Cooper timed it perfectly and set Evander up with a counter to where Evander is out on his feet. Since the ropes held him up, he was given a standing eight count. I don't know how he was able to weather the storm. Then that same round come out of nowhere with everything but the kitchen sink at Cooper for an entire minute to end off round three. The fight would calm down after that and become more technical. Holyfield would outbox and hustle Cooper to where he was able to put him away in the seventh round. Oh, he's taking some shots from the champion now. He's getting ripped. He is getting ripped. Uppercuts. Oops. Holyfield turning it on. I don't know how Cooper is standing. I don't know how he can take this beating. Look at these uppercuts. One of the greatest heavyweight fights of all time between two legends. This was Walcott's second defense of the heavyweight title. In the first round, Walcott will become the first fighter to drop the 42-0 Rocky Marciano. Very competitive fight, but Walcott had the edge on Rocky, and he was up on all judges' scorecards. The 13th round, Rocky stalking, stalking, trying to find the right moment, and there it was. For both guys, really. Rocky threw his hardest shot, Walcott the same, but Rocky threw his just a smidge of a second sooner than Walcott, resulting in Rocky to hit Joe first. To end the fight right then and there to become the heavyweight champion of the world. There was a lot riding on this fight. Pretty much Rocky's entire community bet their life savings and whatever they had that he would win this fight. And as a big thank you, they threw him a parade as thousands of spectators gathered to watch that stretched all over town. This fight was definitely something out of a video game. I honestly don't know how Moore made it out of the round, but it happened. Moore was knocked down not once, not twice, but four times in the fight. The fourth time being counted as a slip. Archie barely made it out of the first round. Ten seconds, Archie Moore is going to make it. There's the bell. Moore would slowly but surely come back in the fight and drop Darrell four times to stop him in the 11th round to retain the light heavyweight title. Moore back at the again. And now he's going to get into the coming right hand. Three, struggling at nine, ten, he is out. Man, oh man, what a dramatic turn in this fight. Moore in the post-fight interview discussed that he didn't really remember much of the first round besides the knockdowns. He stated that the fourth round was a turning point of the fight in his favor. He, uh, when you came into that ring in that beautiful sequin robe, I thought to myself, he looks like Superman. Well, after seeing you fight here to this, this evening, I think you are. Well, thank you very much. I uh, enjoyed the fight. And Archie, was thank there you. any particular moment in the fight when you saw it was beginning to come your way? Well, I saw it beginning to come my way in about the fourth round when I began to stiffen him up with, with good left straight jabs uh -huh. and, and work him around. And then I knew that I could get a right hand punch over, which I did. And on top of that, this is part four to yeet or get yeeted. For another installment, be sure to like, share, and if you're new, subscribe. Subscribe to my Patreon for early access and exclusive projects. This month's Patreon project is on the tale of Oscar De La Hoya versus Manny Pacquiao and Manny Pacquiao versus Ricky Hatton. I'm Alfa Sancho, and I'm out.